everyone. Welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Katherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultants to get them more patients and more profits. Now, today's special guest is Dr. Jeremy Warner of the Warner Institute in Chicago, performing facial aesthetic and reconstructive surgery, and that includes having his own fellowship training program. Now, he attended medical school at the George Washington University of Medicine and continued his training in plastic surgery at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and spent an entire extra year of advanced surgical training fellowship in facial plastic surgery at the University of Toronto. Now, Dr. Warner is on staff at the University of Chicago section of plastic and reconstructive surgery, as well as director and founder of the Chicago Rhinoplasty Symposium. Now, he's also a member of numerous professional medical societies. He's published in multiple plastic surgery books, lectures at the medical meetings, and he's even been featured in numerous major media outlets. He's also served as mission director of the Nepal Surgical and Medical Mission under the Face the Future Foundation. Dr. Warner, thanks so much for joining us at Beauty in the Biz. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Good. All right. So what I like to always start with was your journey. How did you get from a little kid to be a plastic surgeon? And then why Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's going back. That's going back a ways. Um, you know, I I did I was not absolutely um uh, straight path to medicine uh growing up. I had a strong interest in psychology. I would say that it even started in high school. Um uh, of course, I didn't know back then how well it was going to serve me. I think having a psychology background and, and making use of it in the world of plastic surgery is incredibly helpful um, for many, many, many different reasons. But uh, yeah, my my uh, teacher in high school that really was my psychology teacher, I, I was just so fascinated with the whole subject. So I then went on to college to study psychology. And when I finished that, uh, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with all that information. And I don't know what happened, but I remember the day I was sitting in an elevator somewhere and all of a sudden in my brain, it clicked. Maybe you want to actually go work on people's brains, uh, not just talk about psychology. And I, I said, you know, I'm going to go to medical school, actually. This is what I want to do. I want to be a, a neurosurgeon. So I went to medical school to be a neurosurgeon, and I was pretty set on that. And then same thing happened at the end of medical school. Uh, we're figuring out, you know, really nailing down what we want to do. and. Um, you know, I thought, well, love the brain. It's fascinating also to think about operating on it. But I spent some time on a plastic surgery service, mainly doing reconstructive uh, work after uh, head and neck cancers. And I just absolutely fell in love with it. And I said, this is definitely what I want to do for the rest of my life. So uh, I, I ended up going that route, did a plastic surgery training, and then through there decided I wanted to even subspecialize further primarily with plastic surgery of the head and neck and uh, specifically noses as well. And you have a gorgeous office in Chicago. It's like the northern suburbs. It's a beautiful neighborhood. Um, yeah, I'm actually from Chicago, uh, so I know it well. Um, how did you get into your own building? Did you go through academia first for a while, got disillusioned with that and got went out on your own? How did that part happen? I think this is a fantastic question because it's something that Everybody who's going into practice in the beginning is trying to figure out what what do I do and what do I need to know. I just had this conversation with one of our residents yesterday. Um, when I graduated from my fellowship in Toronto, I had all the skills necessary to open my own practice and get going on my own. Um, and I was ready to do that. And it was definitely a good option for me. When I moved to Chicago, another opportunity opened up where I joined a group practice uh, that was hospital based. So we were all employees as a group. Uh, but it was a, you know, uh, I, I'm sure we don't have time to get all the details for that. But for a lot of details, it was it was the right thing to do. It felt good. And you know what, it worked out for a really long time. Um, so just naturally, I ended up progressing into thinking to myself, okay, well, maybe if I was in my own practice, there are some things that I could do um, even better, or some of the goals that I wanted to fulfill that I wasn't able to do in a group hospital-based practice. And for those reasons, I ended up leaving that situation and starting my own practice. Um, 
And you know what? I learned a lot along the way, but it did. I was able to continue my practice that I'd been doing for all those years. I was able to continue it flawlessly, went out, everything worked out. With that, patients followed me. I was able to do the surgeries I wanted to do. Um, but it also did open up more doors for me, especially because I like the business aspect. Uh, but it also allowed me to start my fellowship, which I was unable to do before, and also allowed me to start doing more medical mission work and take a, a greater role as mission director doing that. So well, how many years were you in at the hospital before you jumped to solo? Uh, 11 years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that I've heard that answer several times. Maybe, you know, it's your... um pain threshold, you know, like it takes about 11 years <laughs> to get frustrated. So I think, I think that's a really good way to put it. And I think that that's probably true most of the time. Um, but it's also, uh, it's, you know, 10 years of practice is a really good amount of time to get comfortable in your surgical skills, advance your surgical skills, get comfortable understanding what it would take to run your own practice. Uh, you may not know all of the details or have all of the knowledge at that point, but if you're showing up every day for work and you're spending time in, a, in an operating room and you're spending time in the office dealing with employees and patients, you really can't help but build a really strong foundation for what it's actually going to take to have your own practice. So uh, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's the right amount of time, but yeah, of course, there's other factors like the pain factor you're talking about. It depends on what your initial interests were, what the group might have developed into. You know, if you're in academia, there's a lot of benefits. There's some limitations in a hospital based practice. It's the same thing. There's a lot of benefits, but there's some limitations. And you're also going to grow as a surgeon. So me, for example, I grew into a point where I didn't want to just show up for work every day and operate. I wanted to serve this global mission trip. I wanted to start a fellowship. And at the end of the day, I, I know now that I'm in private practice that I really wanted to be in private practice and have that business so side of it as well. So, And so what would you say was the biggest challenge when you went solo? Like one of the big questions is, do I uh, rent a space? Do I buy a building? Do I hide up on the 21st floor of a 30 floor building or do I try to get on the street so I have, you know, the, the street cred? Um, what, yep. How did you decide to make that decision? Uh, another good question. You've got lots of good questions. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people are going to give you different answers on this is the bottom line. Um, one of the biggest challenges, I don't know if it's so much of a challenge as just an anxiety provoking unknown, which is if I'm going to go out and practice on my own, how do I know that I'm going to succeed? I mean, obviously your, your biggest fear is either renting a place or buying a building and then not being able to sustain your business. And um, so I would say that's the biggest challenge, but it's, it's, it's also an unknown because you don't really know what's going to happen when you do that. But what what you want to do is you very, you you want to do your homework, you want to do your research, you want to look back at your career, and what you want to do is set yourself up to be as successful as possible, knowing what you know, and try to put as many factors in place. Um, renting, you know, I mean, it, it it seems fairly obvious to me that it would be ideal for anybody to go out and own their building. Okay, otherwise you're paying rent to somebody not getting anything long term uh and that's money that's coming you know into your practice but then going right back out again and and rent obviously can be one of your major expenses uh aside from your employees so uh owning your own building is ideal you're keeping that money in your practice you're earning equity in that over time uh, but again all of this falls back to what your intestinal fortitude, as I like to call it, is for the financial risk uh, that it would take for any of these options to go out on your own, whether or not to buy your own building. Um, it's pretty easy to rent somewhere if you're going out on your own up front because you don't have to come up with any money up front. But if you're going to own your own building, you have to buy a certain you know percentage of that building up front. And then if it's just a building, you're going to have to build it out. If you want an operating room, you're going to have to build an operating room. And all of those things taken uh, 
quite a bit of time and energy to put into that, but and as well as whatever uh, financial aspect is involved and whether or not you're in a good position to do that or not. So what did you end up doing when you left the hospital? I bought a building. No kidding. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, it we, takes we, us to do that, but I, but I have to say, um, I've never seen it not work out. You're building the equity. Um, everything has, of course, right now the economy is not fantastic, but you know you're not going to lose on that thing. Um, I, you just have to have the nerve to <laughs> to be in debt, yep. but it's good debt. Yeah. And I heard that from a lot of people when I was trying to decide. Very smart people that I trusted from friends to colleagues to the bank side of things, the business side of things. Um, that's what I was told every time. These You are not going to fail at this. But then I would think to myself, well, then why does not every single person do this? And at the end of the day, I really trusted what I was being told. I mean, I felt that way inside myself, too. But I trusted the fact that I, that this was going to work out and that I just had to put my seatbelt on and strap in and get ready for the ride uh, and just jump over whatever hoop needed to be jumped over or through in order to make it work and open the doors. And uh, while my building was being built, I did have to rent a space in the meantime. So if you want to ask somebody about the differences, I I, you're talking to the perfect person for that because I went through both simultaneously. And again, yes, there are some benefits to renting, just like if you were going to buy a house or rent, you know, it's there's pros and cons to both. Um, and going through the process of building a building, which we basically built from the ground up uh, and then and it has its own operating room in it. So there's all that, too. It's building it out. It's getting it accredited. Um, and there's just a lot of steps to go through. So you, as you mentioned, you just, you have to decide if you are ready to put in that extra effort, which it is, uh, and make it happen. Or if at the end of the day, you just want to spend your energy elsewhere and rent a place. But, uh, you know, for anybody that would be even considering between the two, as as you also said already, there's really no question that it's better for you in the long term, if you can manage to buy a building uh, and make that work. Because at the end of the day, you're building the equity, you're getting everything out of it. And you know what? It feels really good to me when I show up every day and I know that everything I'm looking at is under my control. And yes, it's my responsibility, but I also know at the end of the day that I'm not letting quite a big expense just you know leave the door every day. So. How many square feet do you have? Uh, well, the building has 8,000 square feet. We are currently using 4,000 square feet, which um, which does house my entire clinical practice uh, and a, um, a quad ASF, you know, ambulatory surgery center. Um, the other 4,000 square feet, we didn't need that in order to make things work. So right now we it's sitting empty. We're trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, we have uh, made some effort to see if anybody's interested in renting that space, uh, which again, as a business owner, if we're talking business is fantastic. If somebody comes in and it's helping you pay the mortgage on the place. Um, but we also have multiple ideas to expand into that space with either uh, other I, business ideas related to the pro plastic surgery practice, or potentially even other businesses that are completely unrelated and just things that we want to start business wise between myself, my wife, uh, business partners, other people interested in certain things. Uh, as much as I love my plastic surgery practice, and I have no idea where I'm going to find the time for it, there's like three other businesses that I want to start that have nothing to do with plastic surgery. So. Right. Well, um, strategically, your best bet is to get somebody in there, like, let's say a derm who, you know, yep. just people walking through there all day. Um, but, you know, I also know you like to train and maybe you could turn it into a training center of some sort. But um, you've got so many good options there when you own the place. You can do what you want. So congratulations. Yep. Yeah. Thanks so much. Now, how much of your practice is recon versus uh, uh, cosmetic? Uh, at this point, I would say it's about 
70 percent aesthetic and 30 percent reconstructive and you think you'll keep it that way or what's your plan there yes 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 uh i do get asked this as well because uh with the the landscape of health insurance in this country these days i'm not going to get on a political tangent i promise but there's no question that it's not optimal i don't i don't i don't care if you want to ask or what their solution is to solve it uh, but it's not ideal. So I get asked this a lot. Why don't you just stop taking insurance? You got plenty of business uh, on the aesthetic side. You could run your practice. Yeah, that's true. But uh, I I don't see myself giving up that insurance component anytime in the near future because uh, there are a lot of patients at the end of the day who come to me for care that their care is completely insurance related. And I really, really, really like taking care of them. Uh, they are cases and surgeries that I love doing. I get a lot of satisfaction out of them. Um, and I just don't really want to give that up. You know, uh, I feel like every patient that I help is a worthwhile patient that makes me feel good about what I do, whether it's aesthetic or reconstructive. Uh, but that's just uh, one component that I it gives me so much satisfaction and joy. I don't want to give it up. But then that's worth it. You know, I've watched, oh, yeah. here's where I jump in when somebody is so mired in the insurance and they're just um, frozen. They can't get into cosmetic because they're so focused on the insurance because the insurance patients will keep pulling you forward, you know, pulling you back. And I just say, you got to pick one right now. Like if you're trying to jump, you know, pick one, but you're in that perfect position to keep what you love, but you can still be profitable. If you can balance that, I'm all for it, but usually you can't. You've got to choose, you know, are you going to play in the cosmetic re arena or not? Because your competitors are playing it 24 seven. So, yeah. And when you ask me for the, what percentage is what, I mean, I feel like 70, 30 is a pretty sweet spot, I think, because as you said, if you're going to buy your own building, have your own operating room, um, you look, it's also different in every state. Unfortunately, I live in a state. I love Chicago. I love being here, but it's one of the few states where you can't do insurance cases out of your operating room. Um, that's really? very, well, you won't, you can, but you don't, um, you're not able to collect a surgery center fee, which means at the end of the day, you may be just losing money if you're doing surgeries there. So it basically more or less prohibits us from doing that. Um, you know, so if you have that situation, you have to have a very strong aesthetic component in order to be profitable and make things happen. Um, I think 70-30 is a pretty sweet spot where, uh, you know, I could fill up 100% with my aesthetic practice, but 70%, you know, brings in enough collections that everything is well paid for. And then I do get to maintain that uh, percentage of insurance patients that I really like taking care of. And look, those patients come from referring doctors, okay? So let's say someday my referring doctors uh, retire or, you know, dry up or decide they're going to refer somewhere else, you know, then those things naturally will take place. But if I can maintain that at my own will, uh, it's that's that's my plan because I just, I really enjoy doing a lot of those cases. So in your practice, are you the only revenue generator or have you got others in there making you money? Um, right now, because again, I was in a group practice for uh, 11 years. Uh, I've been in private practice for three years. I was renting in the other space up until even six months ago. So um, my practice has been evolving over time. And I've had, I've had even more non-Jeremy Warner revenue generating people in the practice before than I do now, which sounds weird because I'm in private practice with my own building. Um, but I also want to do things right. And things have changed and evolved and COVID kind of changed and evolved things as I, because I, I was going through this entire change process during that time. So, um, so right now the answer is, is it's pretty much only me. I do have an esthetician, um, but she just started basically. So she is going to be uh, generating more revenues. Um, I have, uh, well, I I have a, my wife is in nursing school right now. Okay. Nice. 
my wife uh, was an MBA. She went to the University of Illinois for business. Um, she's the smartest person I know. She's definitely smarter than I am. And she's had a long career in business and uh, healthcare organization and the business side, administration. And she went on one of my uh, mission trips to Kathmandu, Nepal, right, right before COVID. And she went as a business person to help run the, the, the uh, mission trip. And when she came back, she said, I'm done. I'm done with business. I want to go to nursing school and I want to actually take care of people. Uh, huge change for her. Long story short, she's uh, in an accelerated program because she already had her business degree. So she's going to be done very soon. And then she's planning on doing injections and injectables and uh, generating revenue that way. Uh, then, of course, you have the operating room, which generates its own revenue. So um, that's where I'm at right now. We'll see what happens. Well, see, now you picked right for, for the, your your partner. She's I did. Gonna, she's going to be a great asset to you I did. later and forever. And just keep it, you know, keep it loving, you know. Oh, it yeah. Can, it can be tough to work together and live together. That's another podcast I've done before. But um, mm -hmm. I mean, you two have the same values, the same interests. Um, congratulations. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and, you know, maybe that's not the tangent you want to go on with this podcast, but I will say in short, at least that um, I think plastic surgery is a specialty that is actually a little more prone to spouses working together. Uh, I think when people have their own practices, I think there's a lot of people who uh, work with their spouses to get things started. I think, you know, it, it just makes sense. Uh, and it's not for everybody. And I've, I even have friends and colleagues who I hear, you know, stories where things didn't work out so well and it wasn't the best idea. Uh, but I feel very lucky because my, my, I don't want to sound cheesy. No, no one on your entire podcast is going to believe me when I say this, but my wife is my best friend. Right. And uh, we work insanely well together. Wow. So may that change in the future? Who knows? I'm not going to predict the future. But uh, yeah, it's a great asset to have us both working and generating revenue in the same practice. Um, and uh, at the same time, you know, we're very synergistic because she's got that business side of her and I'm the surgery side. And it works out really well. So in your because she's in school right now. Um, in your practice, is there an office manager or how yes. is your practice set up? How, what kind of staff and what are they doing? Uh, I, okay, that I, I, I love this question. I think that the number one biggest mistake that plastic surgeons do, and maybe it's all doctors, but I just know this because we, we're all, you know, we're all friends. Everyone in my area is friends nationwide. You know, we're, we're as a specialty, I think we're overall quite collegial. So we all kind of talk to each other and know what's going on. And I think, in my opinion, I think one of the biggest challenges slash mistakes that plastic surgeons make is over hiring staff. So um, I see it all the time. I walk in a, you know, a friend's office once in a while or a colleague and I say, holy cow, you're paying a lot of people to do these things. So um, when I started my practice after being in group practice for 11 years, when I went out and I started my own practice, I, my, my schedule was full when I was in group practice. And my patients followed me and business was actually stronger when I left. And at that time, I, 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 my wife was working uh, a healthcare job at the time. And I begged her to come help me open my practice just because she's smart. And so we had her running things at a high level, you know, on the employee side, financial side, accounting side, marketing side. Um, and I had one surgery scheduler and one clinical staff member who was a medical assistant, not a nurse, not a PA. And then a couple of days a week when we had our really busy clinics, we had a part-time person coming in and working at the front desk answering phones. So, uh, I was able to run an incredibly successful practice based on that. Now, the problem is, is that we, even though we were really busy, we continued to grow very quickly after I went into private practice. So it, it was a great model and it probably could work long term, but it was starting to get, uh, it was starting to ask a lot of the people that were there. 
and they loved being there and they loved their jobs and they loved every single thing they did. And I had very open conversations with them. I've worked with these people for a long time. But, you know, I could see three years down the road, I could see the burnout coming because, uh, you know, you can only do so much and sustain it. So uh, now that we have our own building, my wife went back to school. So we did hire an executive director, office manager who basically was replaced what my wife was doing uh, from a business standpoint, overseeing employees, just making sure that everything was running properly, managing the building uh, and more high level things. Uh, my wife is an aside is still, even though she's in school, she's still got her hand in helping with the financial stuff. Um, we hired a nurse because we have our own operating room now. So we did hire one nurse. Uh, we hired a second MA because my clinic days, I didn't want the other medical assistant to burn out. So we hired another one. And, uh, you know, they're both busy, but I think at a good, healthy level now. And they, they basically run the clinic uh, Monday through Friday, making sure that everything runs smoothly, taking care of patients. Um, and then I still have my same surgery scheduler who's focused on getting all those surgery schedules, talking to patients every day. Uh, since we're since we're on a marketing podcast, or at least I know you have a strong background in marketing, you know, she's in charge of making sure that all that runs well at the same time. Um, and then we have this employee who was working for me sort of in the in the middle of this whole transition to the new building. We hired someone to help answer phones and just kind of take care of all the loose ends. She's the one that was in esthetician school during that whole time. She now just finished last month and passed her boards. Uh, she just had a baby, so she'll be back in three months. She's going to take a little break. But then when she gets back, uh, we're going to start her out having her full uh, uh, med spa aesthetic practice. So uh, that's where I'm at right now. Nice. Um, I, I hear you say surgical scheduler, right? Yes. All right. To me, that means who did the consult then? Like I call them patient care coordinators and they... I call them the revenue generators next to the surgeon. Yep. They're the next revenue generator. So um, it, do you really only have her schedule or is she, are you working together as a team to convert these leads? Uh, we are working together as a team. I will actually correct myself because you pointed that out. I have worked with this particular employee for almost 12 years and oh. she did start out as only my surgery scheduler. Okay. When I was in this group practice. Uh, that just gets stuck in my mind. So yes, she really is more of a patient care coordinator. Um, we do work together on uh, consults, quoting, uh, marketing, getting patients excited about these things. Um, so yeah, it is definitely, her role is definitely more comprehensive, as you say. Um, you know, we could have a great debate about this subject because I think people feel differently about it. I feel like I have a lot of word of mouth business now. Um, I do do some marketing. Uh, it may not be as much as a lot of other people. Uh, and when patients come in to see me for consults, I feel like they're coming in to see me. I feel like they're coming in because of my reputation. These people, you know, these patients, they heard about me from a friend or a family who thankfully said, I was really great and go see this guy. And I feel like when patients come in, they want that experience of having time with me and having me give them a lot of information and going through things with them. Okay. So at the end of the day, we, yes, my patient care coordinator and I, we both work on things together. But uh, if you ask my other employees, like say my executive director, She's going to tell you that patients come in for me and that I'm the one who's really doing 95% of the sales. I do like talking to people, you know, sometimes, as you've probably already seen tonight, I probably talk too much sometimes, but, um, you know, you know, other people might debate and say, you know what, if you want to see a lot more consults, you should spend a little less time with people and let your patient care coordinator do a lot of information and do the selling for you. And I've seen that model work too. Okay. So I'm not even sure there's a right or a wrong. Uh, and I, I think it would actually be kind of a fun debate because I think people would feel pretty strongly about either one. Um, but I also think that 
as an aside, it depends on what your business model is. Um, I would say my business model is, you said you grew up in Chicago, you know the area. I'm in the north suburbs of Chicago. Uh, it's a very, very, very affluent um, uh, area of Chicago. And, um, you know, I probably do charge maybe a little bit more than the average. Uh, if you were to get on uh, real self or something and look up what are the averages for a certain place. But, you know, part of that added value that I'm asking patients to pay is spending time with me and getting the information from me. So, uh, and I'm telling you, it works. It works for me. So, yeah, I think maybe people feel a little differently about it and how much should they do and how much should I do and how I should be spending my time. And look, if I could see more consults during the day, I would love that. But at the, at the same time, I, I try to offer this added value of sitting down with patients, not feeling rushed. And then when you ask them to pay just a little bit more, they they do it because they appreciate that you're there, you know, taking care of them. So um, another perspective coming from I am a cosmetic patient, um, we have two things we're looking at the clinical side which is you. We want to make sure you know what you're doing and we're going mm -hmm. to get great results and we're, we are reassured by you. The other side is the emotional side and the money side. Um, I've learned that plastic surgeons should not negotiate. Um, I, should the minute a price comes up, say, let me go get Sarah for you. She's going to yep. take care of you with that. Um, 100% so, agree with that. Yeah. And um, I just find uh, the coordinator can be a nice buffer between the patient and the doctor. So there's a chance I'm just making this up, but there's a chance you said something that confused her, let's say, but she's not going to say it to you because you're not her friend. You know, the coordinator, like women love to talk. So the coordinator <laughs> can, you know, she can run it by her, take it, take it care of it. And now she can keep moving forward with a yes. I just like to cover both bases, you know, yep. the clinical, the emotional, and then the money. <laughs> I totally, I could not agree with you more. You summed it up. You summed it up perfectly. And I will tell you that that is how we function. But I, but I but I've also seen other practices where the surgeon spends a lot less time than I do with patients at the consult, and heavily relies on their patient co care coordinator to not only give information but also really um, employ. I will say, uh, you know, a large number or some effective sales tactics as well. And uh, that's fine too. I just feel from my business sense that there is a difference between those two models because I don't feel like I have to, I, believe me, I do employ some sales tactics. I understand what's behind marketing and everything, but I don't feel that that comes across to patients at all and that I don't have to be, you know, quote, really salesy in front of them. Whereas if you unload that onto the other, uh, person in your office who's not the doctor, I think they have to pull out of their pockets a lot more sales techniques. And 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 I just, I hear it from patients who go shopping around different practices. I just hear this all the time. You know, patient will say, oh, well, I was over at someone else's office and I just felt a lot of pressure and they were trying to get me to sign up for a bunch of surgeries added on that I wasn't there for. And I only spent five minutes with the doctor and the other person just came across really overwhelming and uh, pushy, for lack of a better term. And uh, uh, I'd like to think that people don't say that about me. We actually do send out surveys after all of our consults and uh, just hearing from our patients as to why they chose us. I just I feel like there is a, a bit of a. a difference between those two types of models where if you spend a little more time as the physician, the other person definitely there to support, but probably doesn't have to pull out as many sales tactics that might turn someone off. You just have to know yourself. And if you're yeah. trying to scale, the problem is you're trying to scale it, but it's you, you are the business, you know, you're the manager, you're the service provider, you're the visionary. So yep. you're just, you'll grapple with this your whole career. You're trying to yes. figure out how do I make more of me so I can make more money, you know, so I can yeah. live a bigger, better life. Um, there's nothing easy about that. But here's what I would say in today's world. There's so much technology um, that you there's a lot you can do using technology that makes the patient appear as if they know you. They've known you forever. 
and you've really only met them for 10 minutes in real life, but the rest of the time was spent on, on line, on video. Yep. So, yep. Anyway, I'm sure you're doing just fine, but you know, yep. the, I agree with that too. Mm -hmm. the, but the answers come out in the results. If you have a good conversion rate that you're happy with, who cares how you're doing it? <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah. I mean, keep doing what you're doing, but you'll evolve eventually because yeah. I think what happens is if you've been doing this a long time and you have talked about a rhinoplasty until you're blue in the face, um, you know, I think you start like shortening things or you start, you know, I would think that's anyway. Oh, there's, there's definitely without a doubt, there's a tendency to want to do that. Uh, uh, somebody asked me the other day, they were just kind of making kind of a conversation, asked me how many rhinoplasty consultations I've done. And. I mean, I try to think back, try to quickly calculate, and I'm sure it was, I'm sure it wasn't completely accurate, plus or minus. But I mean, it's a lot of consults I've done, and you know, there are days, you know, you're not on your game, you are, you were in surgery most of the day, whatever the case may be, where you could easily find yourself spending three minutes instead of you know forty, and you know, but again, it's it's. My fellowship director taught me taught this to me when I was in my fellowship, and I, 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 I use it all the time. You're asking when your patients come in and they are excited to see you and they want a certain result for something that they've been thinking about a long time that's going to make them happy. And you're asking them to go through the risk of making that happen and also paying whatever fee to make it happen. Your practice needs to be like going to a play or an opera or a show. It needs to be flawless. And, you know, when you go to a show, you see the actors on stage, the lights, the music, it all comes together. It looks great. You don't see all the people running around behind the curtains and the people up in the rafters. And man, if you saw all that, it would look like a complete chaotic mess. But all you see is the show and it comes across perfectly. And that's, you know, if you're going to ask somebody to pay all this money to have this surgery done, you got to put on the show every time. You know, you can't give up. You can't be off your game. Uh, you know, you don't go to a show and see someone just sit down on a chair and look at the audience and say, I'm tired. Sorry, I'm only doing half my lines tonight. You know, so uh, that's what I get in my head every single day I go to work is, yeah, I put on a show sometimes because I'm not, you know, I'm human. I, I'm not. 100% on my A game every day, just feeling great. Uh, but you have to come across to patients that way. Because if you want to be lazy one day and not do that, you've got eight consults planned, you're probably not going to convert any of them. So like, why did I even show up to work today? You know, I don't know that's just what I think in my mind. All right. So give me one business decision that wasn't your best. And I'm not, I don't want to call it a mistake because I think it's all a learning adventure. Um, but what did you learn from it? Uh, well, I made, I made mistakes building my own building. Um, and that might be a, a topic of interest to answer. Um, I already mentioned over hiring and I think a lot of plastic surgeons do it. Um, you know, at this point where I'm at right now today, as we're talking, I might be a little guilty of that. I don't think as egregiously as a lot of other people. Um, but, you know, uh, you want employees to come to work every day and be busy and you want them to like their jobs and you want them to be happy and you don't. And it's also your biggest expense. So you don't want to be uh, over hiring for all those reasons. If you have people coming in and they're sitting around all day bored. Well, they're not going to like their jobs and they're going to start, you know, I won't say getting lazy, but, you know, they're going to start getting used to not being busy. And then when things get really busy, they're not going to be used to it. And then you're going to have some HR problems or whatever. So tons of reasons why you shouldn't overhire. Uh, and again, I, I, I'm probably guilty of that right now, but not, like I said, egregiously. Um, I would say the other one is when you build your own building, just be prepared to make mistakes. And that's exactly what I'll call them. I mean, there are just things that you might not have anticipated, or maybe you should have researched further. It took so much time and energy to build this building. And I really put in as much effort as I possibly could, which was a lot. But I, if I would have put in more, I might not have made some mistakes along the way, you know, choosing how to build certain things, interior design, whatever it may be. Uh, 
just to hit, to hit home on it, my, my cousin is an architect at a very large firm. And he and I, he's, he was following me along the whole building process. We got to the end and I said, hey, Chris, what do you think a reasonable percentage would be for change orders while you're building your building? For, for people that haven't built their own building, a change order is when you decide every single aspect of the whole building up front and they tell you what it's going to cost and you build it. Change orders are where you find mistakes along the way and you have to change what you planned originally and it costs money every time. And uh, he said, well, at our firm, we really try to stick close to 3% really good, 4% all right, 5% starting to get a little high. And he said, what was yours? What do you think yours was? And I calculated and I had the sheet. I, I, I had the change order sheet in front of me. It listed every change order and how much. Chris, it was 18%. <laughs> 18%. Okay. So um, if I were to go build another building tomorrow, I guarantee you I could keep it to at least 5% because I've sure. learned. Did you? But use, yeah. Did, were you using consultants or you were just. Oh, yeah. I had a company that did. That I had a company. Um, I, don't, I don't know how deep you want to get into this conversation, but I had a company. When you build your own building, you can either do all the components yourself and organize everything, the architects, the builders, the interior design, the surgery center accreditation. You can, you can do all that yourself. I used a company that charges a bit of a premium to do everything for you. Meaning, meaning, sure. meaning I still made all the decisions at the end of the day, how I wanted things to look, how I wanted the layout of the building to be, where every room was. You know, you still have, you still get to decide all that, but you have people doing it for you initially. And then just sort of showing up at your desk saying, hey, do you like this? Where do you want this? Do you want to change this? It's much more efficient for a surgeon. There's no way I would have had time to coordinate it all myself. So yes, I had a consultant. It was a company. They find the building. They, they help you find the building. They do the construction drawing and plans for the building. There's an interior designer that helps you with everything. And then, you know, they help. They, they know how to build it so that your OR will get accredited. And it's kind of, you know, nuts to bolts. but there's meetings. Okay. There's lots of meetings for that. There were meetings. I remember I'd leave the office at 6 PM. We'd go there, we'd order dinner and we would leave there at 1130 PM. I mean, you're talking like 1130 PM. You're sitting there picking out what toilet paper roll holders you want in the bathrooms. So do I care about that at that point? No. And so there's things that you only, it, it, for me anyway, I, I gave it my all, but it definitely pushed my limits. There's some things that I just wasn't paying attention to during that process. And then they go to build it and I would go in the building and say, whoa, what do you, whoa, that's wrong. And they would open up their laptops and they would say, okay, you know, January 14th, here's your email approving this. And I would look at it and there's my signature. Okay, well, we have to change that. And that costs money. So uh, lots and lots and lots of mistakes along that front because we're not taught that in medical school. Well, it just looks beautiful. So I know the behind the scenes, the story is always long and lengthy and funny, but or not, <laughs> but uh, yeah. it looks great what you ended up with. So we're going to switch gears and talk about marketing because that's my favorite topic. Um, yeah. You entered a very affluent neighborhood, like you mentioned, and it's not short on talent there. So um, is there, how did you enter that marketplace? Because you're, you're kind of, you're, you were the new boy on the block, right? So how, were, how did you enter? How did you say, here I am? <laughs> Um, I love talking about this because I feel like the way I went about it was, uh, slightly unique, slightly scary for me, risk-taking, but again, just jump back to my fellowship. I, I did a plastic surgery training head to toe and, but I knew when I left residency that I was far more fascinated, you know, in facial procedures as opposed to body procedures. So when I went and did my fellowship, I spent a whole year doing nothing but facial uh, training. So, uh, I knew when I got out in practice that that's what I wanted to do. And I wanted my practice to be focused on that. The vast, vast, vast majority of plastic surgeons in this country do everything from head to toe. So, um, one of my favorite books I've ever read is blue ocean strategy, which I'm, I guarantee you've read. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's probably for me the best way to look at it. 
It's, you know, you jump out and practice and you're doing the same work that everyone else is doing. And how do you set yourself apart? How do you market yourself when, you know, everyone's doing everything from head to toe. Everyone's got a med spa. Everyone's got a similar looking office. Um, you know, most plastic surgeons are, their, their patients love them and they're you know, sociable and take good care of patients. So, I mean, what are you going to do that's different, you know? Um, and then, oh, now your book's out in the background there. You buy your book and you figure out you know, everything you need to do to make yourself different, but you're very successful. And that book is fantastic, by the way. I'll plug that book for you. Thank you. But the problem is, is every plastic surgeon in the country has your book now. So <laughs> everyone's doing the same thing. So there you go again. It's like, uh, you have so many great ideas in there, but I'm sure that most plastic surgeons, or if they're smart, they've read that book and they've employed all those things. So um, maybe what you should do is create a, a, a 10 series book that you only give one series out to a certain number of plastic surgeons <laughs> and let them fight against each other. But um, so when I graduated from fellowship, I didn't want to be head to toe. I wanted to specialize in face facial surgery and particularly noses. Now, uh, I'm sure you know this. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Maybe uh, maybe not all your listeners know. But uh, that's not something that most plastic surgeons do. It's a little bit scary because when I went out and practice, uh, I saw all of my partners when I went into this group practice who were doing mostly body stuff, a lot of reconstruction, and you know they had lots of referrals coming from lots of different places and you know, everything that came through the door, they would do. Whereas I was sort of limiting myself from the beginning in some way, which, which means I was not as busy as my partners in the beginning. Fast forward three years, paid off because what I did is I went out, I met as many referring physicians as I could meet, mainly ENT doctors, dermatologists, Mohs surgeons, um, Things that were related to me having both an aesthetic and reconstructive face oriented practice. And it just took a lot longer to dig my heels in and make it happen. But once it happened, the inertia was the inertia was a little slow. But once it took off, it was exponential because I had automatically I had set myself apart from everybody else. It finally got to the point where if someone mentioned nose, my name came up. And it doesn't matter what group it was from, so far reaching all the way across Chicago into the neighboring states around the Midwest. And uh, that's just something, that's the kind of word of mouth and referral business and marketing, by the way, even paid marketing, that is just so much easier to market as opposing to as opposed to saying, no, I'm like everybody else. I'm a jack of all trades. I'm master of none. And, you know, I'm good at what I do. But I don't know how you want me to say I'm better than the guy down the street because I know him and he does great work and he also does everything I do. So um, it's a lot easier for me, especially now, fast forward 12, 13, 14 years, whatever it is, that uh, marketing this is so just easy now because. If you live in a big city like Chicago in an affluent neighborhood, it's even easier to have patients come find you because you're the expert, right? So yes, it's very difficult to start a practice in an area that's affluent with a lot of plastic surgeons. And Chicago is not the only one. There's lots of places. But if you have one area of uber expertise that you can set yourself apart from what everyone else is doing around. It doesn't even matter how big the city is. It has been so easy to market that and so successful that that when I teach residents and fellows and they're trying to figure out, hey, how do I buy a building and have a successful practice like you? Here's how it is. You've got to have at least one thing that really sets you apart that hopefully is a high collections generator. and. Um, and just market the heck out of it, whether it's going and meeting people face to face, uh, word of mouth, your referrals, marketing, paid SEO, paid, paid, paid advertising, organic advertising, 
whatever it may be, it's just so easy when you're the expert. Because when you live in a big city, people are saying, I don't need the everyday head to toe person. I need the expert for my problem. And it just, uh, that's to me is my number one key to success when people ask me, how did you get to where you are? Now, you didn't mention social media and Rhino and social media go together. I didn't. I um, didn't. Are you dancing on TikTok or what? Nope. 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 Uh, you're not going to like my answer to this, but um, I have never been a fan of social media and I'm okay saying this. And I'm talking personally, I'm not talking business wise. When uh, Facebook came out and social media and now Instagram and now TikTok and everything else. Um, personally, I've never been a fan and I've never gotten into it. And I, I, I never say never to anything, but I don't think I ever will like it. Okay. Business, social media, I'm a little more lax on, I'm okay with it. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, I didn't mention that because we don't really spend much time doing it. Now, Interesting. as a marketer, you could say, you're crazy, man. Don't you see what your colleagues are doing? Yeah, I do. But, uh, you know, here I am. I'm in my own practice. We have our own building, our own operating room. Uh, lots of word of mouth referrals, lots of referral service. I, 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 I'm, I'm, only, I'm only saying this to prove a point. I don't like saying this because I, I, I don't ever boast or brag about anything. I'm saying this to prove a point. Right now, our waiting list for consults to get in is somewhere in the order of like five months. Nice. Something like that. Nice. Okay. So, and our conversion rate is high and we're filling things up and business is good. Okay. So why, and this is what I always ask myself and same thing true with websites, as far as I'm concerned, why would I put in another 30 grand into a website or put all this energy into dancing around videoing, editing, and, you know, staying after clinic and it's dark. And I, I love my family. I love my dogs. I want to go home. Um, I love my job, but I'm not the guy that's there 12 hours, eight days a week. And um, so let's say I put all this energy into that to do what? To get a, a waiting list out to six months instead of five? I mean, you know, where does it end? I, 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 I take no pride in have a, having a waiting list for five months, let's say, or six months or a year. To me, that's not good business sense, okay? Because a lot of those patients are going to find someone else in the meantime because they want something now, you know? A better solution would be how do I create more time? And you already mentioned this up front. And to me, that's the number one biggest challenge in my life is how do I continue to do exactly what I'm doing in my business right now, but get every single person in the door for a consult within a month and get them signed up for surgery because these people, you know, a lot of, I think when you have a long waiting list, it you're going to lose a lot of people. So um, I don't think that that's anything to brag about, to be honest. But going back to my point, what I done has worked with I would I would say fairly minimal marketing overall, um, and really no social media at all. And uh, given the fact that I fundamentally personally don't partake in those things uh, on, a, on a personal level. Uh, I, I don't see how it's going to help me right now, to be totally honest with you. Uh, there's definitely people that make it work. So I get it. Uh, you know what? There is no one right answer for any of this. In your particular scenario, social media is not needed. In mm -hmm. others, it's vital, you know, yeah. especially for rhinos. So good for you. If you don't have to play that game, I wouldn't. It's time consuming. It's expensive. It takes all. It takes you. You know, you can't. Um, they can't just um, Photoshop you in. You've got to be there. So, gosh, I mean, if your numbers are the way they are, yeah, here, if you want my two cents, which you don't need, but um, I would say that. I I, two cents. But if you have that much of a waiting list, I would be so good at qualifying the leads that are inquiries into suspects, into prospects. I would have them jumping over quite a few gates because you've got to have a 90% close rate. Um, because you're so in demand, just saying. Well, you know what? Next time you're in Chicago, since you uh, used to live here, we'll go grab a coffee. And I'd love to hear how to make that work. Yeah. Well, like I said, the biggest, the biggest challenge to me is, you know, 
uh, like you said, duplicating myself, you know, because I do think patients find value in the way that I handle everything from the consultation through the surgery, through, you know, taking care of them. Um, but you know, if I could see double the consults that I see in a consult day or consult time and do double the surgery, you know, I, you know, you take five months of waiting list, let's get it down to one month and let's duplicate myself and do twice as much work. Great. But you know, that's, that's impossible. I can't duplicate myself. So it's, 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 I'm sure it's something that every surgeon deals with when they get to that inflection point of, well, I really worked so hard to make my practice work and it's really successful. And I was always so nervous about it getting to that point and it's finally there and it's a dream come true. But now I have this headache where I don't want to make people wait that long and I want to get people in for surgery and there's certain things I don't want to give up. I mean, I have given up a lot of things that I didn't, that I never thought I would. Um, okay, it's a good example. So. I know of surgeons around me and colleagues that they will see patients quickly. They have their patient care coordinator sell the surgery. Um, that way, they're just able to see a lot of consults. They don't charge as much, so it's more of a it's more of a hamster on a wheel. I call it where it's you know uh, high volume, low price, and um, they have someone else selling their surgeries, and then they do the surgery, and then they probably you know not probably they hire a PA or a nurse who sees most of their post-ops, okay? Um, I don't know how they make that work. <laughs> that actually came up in my book. I, I said, I don't, you know, did you I, 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 don't, I don't have the courage to jump off that ledge and do that. My, and maybe I'm wrong, but I do not feel like my patients would tolerate paying as much money as they do to never see me again after surgery, okay? Until they're like in an extreme problem that should have been taking, that I should have seen a long time ago before, you know, it got to me. I just, I feel like, to me, that seems very stressful that you're going to have a lot of patients angry that they're not seeing you. And it's going to create a lot of um, negative, negative experience well, from them. Well, out in your reviews. Is yeah. Where, whereas, you know, I am, I mean, every patient I ever operate on, for instance, has my cell phone. Not one patient's ever abused it in my whole career. Um, but the fact that they have it, they love it. Okay. And, it, and I only use that as an example of a theme where I'm telling you, yes, would I love to just operate and see consults and never see a post-op patient again? It would make my life easier. It would make my life easier and I could see more consults and I could generate more revenue that way. But for me personally, there is a point at which I feel like that's really hard to give some of that up because uh, it's, uh, I don't want to say this in a judgmental way because it's really not. But at again, inflection points, there's some point at which you could make more money by compromising the patient experience with you personally. And, and that definitely can happen. But I, I guess it's how you feel as a surgeon. There is a certain point at which I'm not willing to compromise that patient experience to generate more money. Um, uh, it's like, you know, if you have a good practice and it's successful and you've got enough money, uh, I don't want to give up certain things to make more. So, and I know not everybody feels that way. And I see it. There's models out there where people just consults, surgery, let the PA see all the post-ops, call me if their nose is about to fall off, you know? And uh, God, I just don't know how they do it. I don't know how. God bless them. <laughs> so we're going to wrap it up, but I want to talk about mindset because you didn't get this business and marketing mindset from the hospital. Where did this come from? Um, part of it was education. Part of it was internal drive and reflection uh, and uh, learning these things on my own because I was interested in them. Um, as I said before, my fellowship fully trained me and prepared me to be in private practice. 
Um, I felt very comfortable with all aspects. Uh, back then, that was 2008, 2009. So internet marketing and all that wasn't it brand new by any means, but it was not as, you know, uh, the, the force that it is now. Um, so I didn't, I wouldn't say I learned a lot on that IT technical marketing side of things, but I learned how to, I was ready to run a practice. So, um, some of it was taught by that. And then I got in practice and, and, and as I said before, there was the first three years was a little slow. I got to the point after like, let's say year two, where I was, I don't even know if I can stay in this practice. I don't know if this is going to work. Um, you know, my partners are way busier than I am. I'm not getting any support from the hospital. Uh, my chairman of surgery said, I can't help you. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a hepatobiliary cancer surgeon. I don't know anything about plastic surgery or marketing. So it's not that I'm not willing to help. I just, I don't know how to help you. And it just forced me to say, either this is going to work or it's not. And, and I'm going to try to make it work. So I'm going to put all my effort into it. So, you know, I met people, I talked to people, I had friends. How do I market this? And the, the, the same theme came up that I already mentioned was everybody kept saying, you're such a unique expert in these small, in this small area of things. Why don't you really market that and use that to your advantage, especially when you live in a big city like Chicago? And so that's what I did. I went out, I met, like I already said this to some degree, I won't beat a dead horse, but met the right referring doctors. That's key. The right ones. Um, do good work. You got to have good surgical results or you're never going to ever have a chance of getting word of mouth, which is what you really want at the end of the day. If I had nothing but word of mouth, my life would be awesome. Um, and uh, so you got to deliver good results. You got to deliver a good patient experience, especially if you're asking people to pay average or even more. Um, and then the one thing that really helped me take off in year three was was the digital was marketing with uh website, SEO, that kind of stuff. So what I did is I created, uh, it was not an expensive website. It was geared primarily to look like an expert in noses because I was, and I just spent some money marketing that. Now the scary thing is, and my, the scary thing is my wife at the time said, you are not doing this because the hospital provided no support. So I, I had to take my after taxes dollars and spend it on this marketing, which is crazy crazy but you know what the re the return on investment with that small amount of money each month with the website going was 20 times 20 times uh ROI okay so it works and that really helped me get my no specific practice uh off the ground and got me a little more well known than just the referring physicians and um, uh, the word of mouth and things like that. But that really helped bring in the volume, which then the word of mouth it's an inverted pyramid, as we all know. So you get you get you get a good amount of volume in there, and then the word of mouth takes off, and then somebody goes to their physician who's not heard of me, and they say something nice, and he says, "Oh, I've been looking for someone like that." So um, that's I would say that was the key to my initial success, the, the the launch off the launch pad to get there. Well, you did a great job. I mean, in three years, you've really made some progress. Good for you. So last question, tell us something we don't know about you that's very interesting. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, I'm a pretty open guy. What do people not know about me? Um, I would say I don't talk about it much. So people may not know that I've done two uh, Ironman triathlons. Aha. Uh -huh. That's um, very interesting. Yeah, no, I think I think you know it, we people want to talk about that all day. For those um, who don't know what an Ironman is, what do you have to do? Okay, an Ironman race is something that humans were not meant to do and really should not do. But there are um, a certain number of people on the planet, and I was one of them, that wake up one day and say, "I really want to do this." Uh, an Ironman triathlon is a one day event. Um, they have races all over the world now, but it's a one day event where you start at 7.30 in the morning in your swimming suit, cannon goes off, you jump in the water and you swim two and a half miles through the water, get out of the water, change into your uh, bicycling clothing, 
get on a bicycle, you ride 112 miles, and then you finish, you get off your bicycle, you put on your running clothes and your running shoes, and you run a full marathon. And this is all back to back in one day. So uh, it is my greatest achievement in my entire life. I and love being a- twice? I can see yeah. you it once, but to do it twice? Oh, here's the best part of this whole story. You ready for this? I did it the first time. I wasn't going to do it again, to be honest. It was monumental. It was having a full-time job training. I wasn't going to do it again. And then my wife, she came up to me one day and she said, I see how proud you are, how proud you are of that accomplishment. I can't believe when you talk to people about it, nobody can believe that you did that. I want to do that. It is my goal in life and I want to do it. And she said, you're going to train me because you've done it before. So you're going to be my trainer. And I told her, if I'm going to train you, then I'm going to be in shape again. So I will then just do it with you. So we did it together. And I won't make you guess who won. I'll just <laughs> tell you that my wife beat me by two hours. Oh, my God. She beat me by Two, I was nervous. She wasn't going to finish. Or you were just letting her. No, she legitimately. I would. Oh my God. Listen, I used to let my kids get away with winning things when they were five. There, my, there's no way I would let my wife win this on purpose. Okay, two hours she beat me. Wow. Um, and we were not married at the time. And when she came to me and wanted to do this race, of course I had done it. I was impressed with myself for doing it. I was so impressed with her for wanting to do it. I said, if this woman does an Ironman triathlon and finishes, I know I'm meant to be with her. Aww. So I, I proposed to her at the finish line. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. We got a video and everything. It's awesome. Did she want awesome. it that way or does she wish she had makeup, hair and makeup? Yeah. Oh, no. She <laughs> wanted it that way. No. She's I She's beautiful and she's, you know, she's drop dead gorgeous and she's, you know, but, but she looks good whether she's camping or, you know, going to a, a social event. So Good she, she didn't care about that at all. <laughs> all of us do not look this way when we wake up. Just me. All right. So <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Warner. By the way, if somebody wants to talk to you about all of these various topics, how would they get, get a hold of you? Um, the easiest way is probably email, which is J Warner. That's my first initial last name at Warner Institute, all one word dot com. J Warner at Warner Institute dot com. Um, they can also call me on the phone. Doesn't, you know, doesn't bother me. Uh, phone number would be 224-420-6140. Yes, that's my cell phone. I give it out to pretty much everyone in the world. Um and uh, th those are going to be the two easiest ways to get okay. it. And your website is warnerinstitute.com, right? Correct. Yep. Uh, thank you so, so much. I appreciate it. And um, everybody, that's going to wrap it up for us for Beating the Biz this time. If you uh, feel like it, please give us a review and subscribe so you don't miss any more episodes. And if you've got any feedback for me or Dr. Warner, you can certainly leave them at my website at Catherine Maley MBA. Or you can DM me at Katherine Maley MBA. Thanks so much. We will talk again and take care.